And now, just because we like you here on Talks for Extra Time, something, sir and madam, for the weekend. In fact, more than one thing, six things. I'm going to call it the dirty half dozen for reasons that will become apparent as we welcome back to Talk Sport our very own Lee Marvin. It is, of course, Van Connor. Good morning, Van, and how are you doing, matey? And a good morning to you, Mr. Ross. Uh, do you know, I'm, I'm feeling a little better. It sounds like the world is starting to return uh, rather unexpectedly to normal today. Absolutely. It's been a bit like melting a glacier with a match, but maybe we are returning to a sort of normal fingers and toes and eyes and legs crossed. Um, might even be back in cinemas in six weeks or so, possibly. So let's hope and pray that arrives sooner rather than later. But let's start with your movie recommendations. All of these are on Freeview, folks. So no need for a subscription. We've got half a dozen film recommendations, starting with, well, a great movie, this, I think. I actually enjoyed this first time I saw it more than the Shawshank Redemption. It's Frank Darabont. It's The Green Mile. It's film four. And it's ten past eleven tonight. Why have you chosen this one, Ben? First of all, I think anyone who doesn't just break emotionally at the mere mention of The Green Mile is, is clearly dealing with things and it's dead inside. It's a, a moving, haunting film. And like you say, there's, a, there's an argument here for some people this is better than The Shawshank Redemption because it's obviously sort of a sister piece, a companion piece to The Shawshank Redemption. As you know, from the, the novels are actually set, the novel is actually set in Shawshank Prison and it does form a sort of a, a spiritual sequel, if you were, like a companion piece, as we say. And of course, it's all about those wonderful performances by uh, Tom Hanks and Michael Clark Duncan. This is just a genuinely beautiful film, isn't it? Fantastic period details and beautiful cinematography in this movie, given that it's kind of a very claustrophobic setting. For those who don't know, it's all set on what they call the Green Mile, which is basically death row in America. And I think it's the 19, is it late 20s, early 30s? It's around the kind of depression era, isn't it? It is like the short Show Redemption. This is primarily, this begins in the 1930s, I believe. Late the 30s to 40s, this, this begins. And you've got a clip for us, I think. So I've got you an iconic clip of, this is Michael Clark Duncan's John Coffey being brought to his son, introduced to the Green Mile for the first time. Here we go. Your name is John Coffey. Yes, sir, boss. Like to drink. Only not spelled the same. Oh, you can spell, can you? Just my name, boss. J-O. My name is Paul Edgecombe. If I'm not here, you can ask for Mr. Terwilliger, Mr. Howell, or Mr. Stanton, these gentlemen right there. Questions. Do you leave the light on after bedtime? Because I get a little scared in the dark sometimes. If it's a strange place. I mean, the pathos, even in that clip, it just kind of seeps out of this film, doesn't it? What a movie this is. It really is, isn't it? And what a great performance from the late Michael Clark Duncan there. Uh, wonderful script. Like you say, it looks gorgeous. Frank Darabont's directed this, who directed Shawshank as well. And, of course, you've got that Tom Hanks performance in the centre. Allegedly, uh, Darabont and Stephen King, it was, he was their first choice for both, uh, for both of them. And uh, good job he took it. It's a really great performance. And, of course, winning support from Doug Hutchinson there as the very evil Percy yeah. as well. Great film. So that's 10 past 11 tonight on Film 4. Mine is an afternoon delight for you, folks. It's uh, 2.50, 10 minutes to 3 in the old money. It's BBC Two. It's from 1933. This this film was voted on Rotten Tomatoes, the film review website, the 33rd greatest movie of all time. I absolutely love it. It had two directors, Marion C. Cooper and Ernest Shodzak, and it's got special effects by the man who trained Ray Harryhausen, Willis O'Brien. As soon as I say to you, Fay Ray, you know what I'm talking about, don't <laughs> you? It's the mighty King Kong, the king of the jungle. This is such an awesome film, I think. This is one of the original, you know, one of the original hardcore Hollywood movies, isn't it? This is one of the benchmarks of what we think of as having invented cinema as we really know it today, isn't it? I also love it because it's a, in its own way, it's a film about filmmaking because, of course, Robert Armstrong <laughs> plays Carl Denham, who's this kind of mutant, outlandish, over-the-top Hollywood <laughs> film producer and director who goes to Skull Island. He wants to make a, a hit movie. He brings back a massive gorilla. I've got the trailer from it. It's 1933. This is a pre-code film, folks, which means at the time it was considered quite saucy and there were different cuts around involving Fay Ray, sometimes in slightly more see-through gowns. It's King Kong from 1933. It's 2.50 this afternoon on BBC Two. What's not to love? He'll be out for hours. Send to the ship for anchor chains and tools. What are you going to do? To build a raft to float him to the ship. Why, well, the whole world will pay to see this. No chains will ever hold that. We'll give him more than chains. He's always been king of his world, but we'll teach him fear. We're millionaires, boys. I'll share it with all of you. Why, in a few months, it'll be up in lights on Broadway. Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. 
what a film this is. And I don't know if you've ever seen the, there was a sequel out the same year, in fact, also by Willis O'Brien, more of a comedy than King Kong called Son of Kong. Have you ever seen that? I have seen Son of Kong, yeah. actually. I went through a very big phase of my classic monster movies at one point, actually. It's weird, because Robert Armstrong returns in that, but as I say, it's more of a comedy film. And also, I think Willis O'Brien, it's a shame it never got made. He was working, I think, 1931 on a film called Creation, which is going to be about almost exactly that, but also involve a modern day family shipwrecked in part of Chile or something. If you look at it online, if you're fascinated by this kind of film, folks, you'll see kind of early animation from that. And it's again, you can see how it kind of inspired King Kong, which in, in the end, I think, kind of transformed cinema, did it not? Because stop motion and then this notion of almost a fable, a horror film fable, was something very new for the cinema. Uh, very much so. And I think for how mainstream uh, King Kong would become as well, it did, I think, legitimize visual effects as far as people, as far as people were accustomed to in sort of, you know, the big Hollywood films. It made the idea of the outlandish just a little bit more commonplace for the time. In fact, Mr. Lord of the Rings himself, Peter Jackson, has got an original model from that film, Creation, <laughs> I mentioned it, and he made his own version of King Kong. Nowhere near as good as the original, sadly. So that's 10 to 3 this afternoon, BBC Two, and you're going Marvel Comic Book Universe for tomorrow night, ITV, 9 o'clock. It's Captain America, Civil War. I've kind of lost track of where this is in the kind of canon, where, where this c turns up in the kind of Marvel... Is it, is it the, the second or third Captain America film? This is the third and final uh, solo effort for Captain America. So it's, this closes the Captain America trilogy. It also works as a sort of semi-sequel to Avengers Age of Ultron as well, in that the film basically serves as a sort of Avengers 2.5. It brings the, a, a sort of ideological conflict to the, to the forefront that has to do with the Avengers being accountable for the collateral damage that they cause. The idea that Tony Stark wants to uh, submit the Avengers to government oversight and authority by the United Nations. And of course, Steve Rogers, played by Chris Evans here, you know, has seen what, you know, abs how power can absolutely corrupt and seeks to basically maintain their independence. This brings the two heroes into loggerheads when Cap's old friend Bucky is framed for a terrorist attack. I've got a clip for you of them basically arguing just who should and shouldn't be allowed to have a say in what the Avengers do. Here we go, Avengers, assemble. Tony, if someone dies on your watch, you don't give up. Who said we're giving up? We are for not taking responsibility for our actions. This document just shifts the blame. Sorry, Steve, that, that is dangerously arrogant. This is the United Nations we're talking about. It's not the World Security Council, it's not S.H.I.E.L.D., it's not Hydra. No, but it's run by people with agendas, and agendas change. That's good. That's why I'm here. When I realized what my weapons were capable of in the wrong hands, I shut it down, stop manufacturing. Tony, you chose to do that. If we sign this, we surrender our right to choose. What if this panel sends us somewhere we don't think we should go? What if there's somewhere we need to go and they don't let us? We may not be perfect, but the safest hands are still our own. If we don't do this now, it's going to be done to us later. So that's nine o'clock tomorrow night on uh, ITV. I think it's the first time it's been on terrestrial telly, this, as we used to call it. Is that right? I think so. <laughs> I think it's, it's definitely early in its life cycle on there, but it's a great movie with lots of really spectacular action beats as well. But also, there's a lot of depth to it. This opened around the same time as Batman vs. Superman, so oh, the yes. whole hero on hero concept was quite you know it was banded around a lot of the time but very very different movies there's a lot more nuanced a lot more fun but also quite bright and colorful as well now you wait ages for a lee marvin movie and then two come along at once <laughs> my next two recommendations both feature the great band himself starting with tomorrow night itv4 from 1967 nine o'clock one of robert aldrich's greatest films and he's a brilliant director the cast is fantastic ernest baldwin john cassavetes charles bronson's in it robert ryan telly savalas is a demented character donald Sutherland, Robert Webber, Clint Walker, Trini Lopez, but above all, Lee Marvin. It is, of course, based on the, the idea of recruiting from death row, effectively, the army prison, 12 men to go on a suicide mission, based on a real-life 101st Airborne behind the uh, enemy line squad called the Filthy 13. It's the Dirty Dozen. It's 9 o'clock, ITV4 tomorrow night. Let's hear the trailer. Major Ryzen, you are ordered by Allied Command to select 12 general prisoners convicted by courts martial and sentenced to be executed or serve lengthy prison terms for murder, rape, robbery, and other crimes of violence. And you will deliver them secretly behind enemy lines in France to undertake a mission of sabotage that could change the course of the war.
I mean, I do love this film. I can sit and watch this again and again and again. I'm surprised, actually. I mean, it did great business at the time. But then after a while, I think Robert Aldrich has, has fallen out of favour as a director, I think, hasn't he? Is he, is he kind of unfashionable now, would you say, uh, Van? I think so. I mean, the movie, this movie itself, I mean, noticeably, it obviously spawned the whole franchise. But the first movie is really the only one we ever sort of look back on. It's kind of like The Magnificent Seven in that way. But you look at when it came out, the influence it had. I mean, even at the time, you look at the movies that were out around this era and you look at franchises that brought together this all-star format like the Dirty Dozen did, like The Magnificent Seven does. And this, obviously, of course, would go on to become a sort of template for films that we still use to this day when you get films like Suicide Squad, for instance, in recent years, which are still pitched yeah. to people as it's The Dirty Dozen with comic book things. It became a shorthand, like you have Die Hard on A, you have Dirty Dozen with A. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very strange subgenre defying film in a way. Also stars, uh, the great Jim Brown, former NFL superstar, of course, in it. So that's, uh, nine o'clock tomorrow night, ITV4 from 1967. And staying with Lee Marvin, well, in the Dirty Dozen, he's a good guy. In uh, The Man Who Shot Liberty <laughs> Valance, he's a bad guy. He's the bad guy of the title, Liberty Valance. I love this film. It's a black and white masterpiece, directed, of course, by John Ford. Dates back to 1962. It's 20 past six, Sunday night on Paramount, the Paramount Movie Channel. Great cast again, of course. John Wayne, James Stewart, Lee Marvin, John Carradine, who was also in Stagecoach with John Wayne for John Ford. And this is apparently Sergio Leone's, or was his favourite John Ford Western, because he says in it, John Ford discovered pessimism. Because this is, this is very much about the end of the old West fan, isn't it, this film? Very much so. I mean, I'm sure you'd agree that the idea of John Ford uh, discovering pessimism does seem like a watershed moment in his body of work when you uh, when you look at all the films the man put together over the years. Brilliant cast as well. I mentioned uh, the main stars. Lee Van Cleef is in this as well. Strother Martin and Woody Strode. I've got the trailer. It's the man who shot Liberty Valence. What's not to love? Out of the flame and fury of the frontier, the Old West lives again as only John Ford can recreate it. People with wonderful characters who have become legend in their own time. Of them all, two are the most memorable. Liberty Valance and the man who shot him. That's my stake, Valance. <laughs> you heard him, dude. Pick it up. I said you, Liberty. You pick it up. I love that movie, wow. I must say. Even if you've got to get over in the early bits of the film, James Stewart's slightly uncomfortable looking wig he's wearing. So I've gone <laughs> for my Western of the Weekend, and you've gone for a, a bit of a horror film to end on, a kind of horror shocker. Well, I've been mindly obsessed with this film in recent months because of the release of The Invisible Man at the tail end of last year, the uh, Lee Wan L reimagining of the, the H.G. Wells novel. And this is, of course, uh, from back in 2000. This was from Paul Verhoeven, who, of course, brought us such seminal works, as you would know, of uh, films like uh, Robocop, Total Recall, and of course, Showgirls, which we, we just never ever forget <laughs> exists as a movie. Um, this is a, basically Paul Verhoeven's version of the, of the uh, Invisible Man, starring Kevin Bacon. You've got a supporting cast that includes Elizabeth Shue, Josh Brolin, Zoe Slotnick, Carrie Coon. And the idea here is that you've got a uh, government uh, scientist played by uh, Kevin Bacon. He's Dr. Sebastian Kane. He perfects invisibility using himself as his test subject number two and of course he has a human guinea pig as it were but doesn't quite anticipate that the results will send him mad with power and become a deviant psychotic rapist which of course then leaves his fellow scientists in a position of having to stop him i've got a clip for you of them pioneering this this technique for the so first it's a horror time channel on a large gorilla it's a horror channel it's uh, 10 30 it's sunday night and here's the clip Brain activity returning to normal. Quantum signatures are stable. Welcome back, Isabel.
So two ape films, two Lee Marvin films, some great recommendations, Van. <laughs> can we do it all again next Friday? That sounds like a plan to me, good sir. And remind us uh, where we people can hear you and Rebecca Perfect musing on matters cinematic and new releases and stuff. Uh, you can find myself and Rebecca Perfect every Friday morning on podcast platforms on the Off Screen Show, in which we give you your seven day guide to everything movies on digital, DVD, free view, streaming, the whole shebang. So look out for Off Screen later on this morning. It's me, Paul Ross. It's Van Connor on Talk Sports. Extra time. Thirsty for football? Get your top flight football fix.